Welcome back to How to Fix Democracy, the show about all the problems and solutions of contemporary democratic society. I think one of the things we've learned from this series, we've been going now for three years, we're in the third series, and this is a series about citizenship, is that democracy is all about telling stories. And it's usually the winners, as we know, who tell the stories about which kinds of democracy, what kinds of theories and ideologies and genders and sexualities are the appropriate ones to fit into democratic theory. So it's no surprise that the liberal democratic ideology or ideals of um, 21st century America and Western Europe generally reflect um, a, a colonial white, often male society. Um, and one group of people who we haven't really spoken to, but who are central in many ways, tragically central in the history of modern democracy, are the indigenous peoples of North America and other colonized parts of the world. Today, I'm going to talk to somebody who has increasingly become one of the most articulate um, and convincing storytellers of, uh, of these indigenous people. His name is De Leslin Rue George Warren. Uh, I just found that the word Rue is his nickname and that was uh, taken from his sisters who couldn't pronounce his name was growing up. Uh, Rue is uh, uh, descended at least from the Katawa Indian peoples of uh, of the, the northern part of the southern states, particularly the Carolinas. And he is a, an activist, artist, thinker, polemicist, both <laughs> in, in historical and sexual terms about the struggles uh, of his people. He's a storyteller. Uh, Rue, enough stories from me. Uh, are you comfortable being described as a storyteller? Is that your core business as an artist, particularly when it comes to representing your people? Tanaka, Andrew, yeah, I think that that's a really adequate term for describing what I do. Whenever I give presentations, I always start with the caveat that I don't speak for Catawba Nation, I don't speak for all Native Americans, I don't speak for all Indigenous people. All I can do is um, tell stories about what I've seen from my community story and from other uh, communities as well. So I, that's that's kind of the mode that I work in. Plus, it's kind of a get out of jail free card when people start asking, "What date did that happen?" Well, I don't need to know because I'm not a historian. Tell me why you spend your time uh, representing this indigenous people from whom you are descended. Well, I'm a citizen of Catawba Nation. Um, my, I grew up in a family that was actively involved in my tribe. Uh, my grandfather was our assistant chief for about 30 years. My mom was our tribal administrator. Um, my aunt runs our cultural center. So I was very lucky to grow up in the middle of the political and cultural life of my tribal community. Um, when I was leaving to go to college, what I saw around me were some of these, um, these, these metrics of pain, of colonization that we see of alcoholism, domestic violence, all these things. And I didn't have the language, the framework to understand them as products of history. And so during college, um, as many people do, I started to get that context. And, and from there, uh, led me on a path to coming back to my community, um, living on a reservation and working on language and food sovereignty and policy and funding and all that fun stuff. American democracy is often called, particularly by scholars, um, sympathetic scholars, Lockean liberalism or Lockean democracy. John Locke, of course, uh, was the 17th century English political theorist who founded his idea of freedom and democracy on land, on the mm -hmm. working of land. Do you think that American democracy in that sense is, is Lockean? And if so, it, it seems to be based on a fundamental theft of land from uh, peoples like uh, the you, you, uh, the Katawa people and many others who were the original settlers uh, who, who lived in on the North American continent. 
Yeah, absolutely. And you see this tension in the way that um, leaders of the United States are talking about Indian policy. There's this really amazing letter from 1807 where Thomas Jefferson is writing to uh, the governor of the Indiana Territory, William Henry Harrison, who later becomes a president, shortest lived president. But anyways, Harrison's having problems because he can't get the Indians, the tribes, to give up their land to the United States. And so Jefferson writes in this letter, and it's kind of amazing the things that they would reveal in these letters, which is you're gonna get official instructions, but here is kind of the backstory of these instructions, which is that our goal is to make them stop holding land as a communal body and to start holding land as individual landowners. And this um, comes up over and over again in the late 1800s with the Dawes Act, with the Curtis Act, a little bit later on with termination in the 1950s. And so it has been an important project of the United States to convince indigenous communities or force indigenous communities to understand land as discrete property property, and not something that is uh, for the commons, that is shared in common with each other. Um, so in that sense, I mean, again, I'm not, I'm a storyteller, I'm not a philosopher. So I don't know if, if we're Lockean in that way, but it seems to be like a, an interesting thread there. Well, I think you're, you're a, to be fair, uh, Rue, you're a philosophical storyteller. You're not just, <laughs> you're not telling, um, you're not telling stories just for the, for the sake of entertainment or titillation. Your stories have meaning and significance. And I think this story is enormously important. Mm -hmm. um, let's go back to the issue of land. Uh, as you say, Lockean land or the Lockean notions of land are very much based on extraction, on work. Uh, the settler philosophy, if that's the right word, was to come and ap appropriate uh, profit from the land mm -hmm. and make the land capitalist um, as farmers and then later as speculators. But in terms of your people, what was their sense of the land? You, you seem to indicate that they, they thought of it in terms of the commons as opposed to mm -hmm. the property of, of one family or another. Indigenous communities had really vastly different understandings. I mean, we're talking about people from all over the, the planet, right? Um, we see kind of imperialist notions laid to land um, with the Inca and the Aztec, for example. Um, but then we also see people who are understanding it kind of in terms of property and inheritance, uh, such as a, a tribe up in the Connecticut area. For Catabas, land was a common resource, so fields, um, village sites, these are things that people are sharing in common. Um, but it's also really important to understand that, you know, something you said a second ago about this sense of working the land being the thing that brings value to the land. Um, and that is so illuminating to me to think about because in Catawba, the idea, the word nature doesn't exist. The word wilderness doesn't exist because what are you talking about? The things just outside your house. And in the way that the United States in our school system, for example, talks about native communities as hunters and gatherers, um, kind of paints this picture as if our ancestors were walking through the forest and said, oh, a blueberry, you know? But that is not what tribes were doing, right? They had these large scale management practices. For Catawba Nation, it was large scale burning and it created an ecosystem that was more abundant than it would be without humanity there. And you see this in the records of explorers calling it a garden of Eden, calling it um, a land that was full of, of life and game and beauty. And, and what they didn't understand was that that was not in, dis, in spite of humanity, but because of a relationship between humans and, and the, natural, the natural world, you know, to put it in quote marks. I think one other piece of how Catawba is related to land that was really challenging for settlers to understand is that in traditional Catawba uh, worldview, women uh, control everything related to the land. So if you're trying to plant something in a field, it's the, the job of the women and the matriarchs to decide if that's what you do. If you and someone you wanna live with wanna create a house, you have to go to the women for that. If something's happening with the burial grounds, it's women. And that's actually a tradition that Catawbas keep all at least up until the 1790s, when after the Revolutionary War, 
all three villages of remaining Catawbas get together and say, how are we going to protect our land? And, and this was an early meeting in April. And what they decided to do was to put all of the land under the name in a land title of Sally New River and other women of Catawba Nation. And this is kind of amazing in this new new country in which women are not typically landholders, that Catawbas are still holding on to this traditional idea that women are the decision makers and the protectors of land. Um, and so in that way, the way that we gender land uh, in the United States is, uh, is a little bit different than how Catawbas have. So you're suggesting that the original settlers gendered land, that they were men. I mean, there were women as well, and they worked the land, uh, the, the mm -hmm. settler uh, community. Um, do you think that there's something intrinsically male about Lockean liberalism, particularly its relationship with the land? I don't know, because I think also we have to take a step back and understand that when settlers were coming to the land and they gendered people in certain ways, they brought with them the assumptions about how those people would be acting. So, oh, Sorry, what, what do you mean gendered people in certain ways? So like in Catawba, the word for what we might call men, gang, for women, yeah. But that has had traditionally a different cosmology of associations and meanings, right? Po possibly mapped on to biological indicators, but also possibly not, right? But when explorers are coming, they immediately start putting these things onto the people that they see. Like this person, I, I gender as a woman, and for some reason, she's speaking for this entire tribal community saying that she's the leader. And that seems like kind of out of step, right? So, so there's also these assumptions about there being two genders and that those genders have specific roles in society that settlers were bringing with them. Rue, let's talk about the environment. The conventional view, of course, the Lockean view is that, um, that the farmer the settler farmer was nurturing the environment, mm. um, enriching it. Mm. Uh, we know now that wasn't true. How did um, the indigenous peoples think of the environment? I think the broadest thing I can say about indigenous relationships to land is that we understood our landscapes and the things that inhabit the landscape with us as our relatives, right? Um, and this is one of those maybe indigenous philosophical points that was dismissed early on. Uh, indigenous people saying, oh, that's our friend, the bird, that's our friend, the tree, the, the tree speaks to me, those sorts of things, which are just ways of articulating that there is knowledge that we have about everything that we're sharing the land with. But that idea of we're all related um, is kind of amazing because it was dismissed, but then we have this, re this uh, insurgence of evolution theory in which we find out, no, we literally all are related to one another. And then, of course, um, in the last hundred years or so, um, the creation of these models where we understand these complex chaotic systems where what I do does affect my neighbor in a very material sense. And so, you know, these are kind of the seeds of indigenous philosophy from millennia of living on the lands. Um, I wouldn't say that Definitely not exploitation, although that did happen. Um, you, you meet some communities who talk about these old empires or these old giant cities that they lived in and then left because they saw that they weren't sustainable. Um, I know some communities uh, who have relationships with the city state of Cahokia, which is kind of in the St. Louis area. That is a story that they tell about why they left Cahokia. Um, but it's also not maintenance and preservation, right? It's not this idea that nature is static and that we must freeze it in this moment, which is a large idea of where the national park system comes from, right? The idea of conservation, that to keep this land beautiful and productive and pristine, we need to remove humans from it. But when these national parks in the 1800s were being created, particularly at the um, behest of John Muir and other advocates, um, they didn't differentiate between indigenous communities who had been there for millennia and settlers who were there to cut down lumber or uh, uh, hunt all the game. And what John Muir and others found when they returned after removing indigenous communities was a landscape vastly changed that you couldn't see through the valley anymore. You didn't have these giant herds. And what they were missing was that humanity, humans have always been a part of these landscapes. 
and that the landscapes that settlers saw were that way because of the relationships that indigenous people have with the land. It may then not have been totally coincidental that one of the most influential figures supporting the idea of national parks was uh, Teddy Roosevelt, who of course was one of America's most um, violent imperialists as well. The two might mm -hmm. indeed, as you suggest, go hand in hand. And he is an interesting figure in his relationship with tribes because he kind of bookends, if Andrew Jackson starts the era of Indian removal, uh, Teddy Roosevelt kind of ends the era of Indian removal and tra transition to assimilation. But he also does these like very weird um, kind of performative things about indigenous people. For example, at his inauguration, he had several chiefs from tribes march in his uh, parade to celebrate his inauguration um, and kind of force them into this with no no reciprocity around like diplomacy or anything like that. He also uh, famously said that, quote, uh, a famous general once said that the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Um, I don't believe that that's true, uh, but nine out of 10 uh, chances it is. You know, so he, he has an idea of indigenous people and it's not a positive one. Rue, um... Uh, a distinguished New York University scholar of democracy, David Stasevage, has, has written a new history of democracy, which, um, and, I, and I think we're going to have Stasevage on, on the show, actually, later this year, um, who argues that when it comes to political organization, we've got the story wrong and democracy. The traditional story, of course, is that Western man inherited the principles of democracy from the Greeks, and you had this so-called dark age up until about the 18th century, and then Western man revitalized the principles of self-government and formalized it with the creation of American or Western European democracy. But Stasafaj argues that we have much to learn and thank indeed from indigenous forms of political organization. Do you think he has a point? Yeah, and this is an area that is a little bit out of my expertise, but I know, for example, that Benjamin Franklin was really interested in the political organization of the Haudenosaunee uh, Confederacy, which is, uh, they argue, the oldest extant democracy in the world, tracing back at least uh, 500, 600 years. And, and so that's where I come, because I've thought about this before. Are we really long existing democracies or are we something else? And I think it comes down to that definition of what is democracy. If we're talking about a participatory process that is egalitarian in the sense that people are not excluded based on uh, gender or for example, disability, um, then you know, is that a democratic process? Because like when you look at uh, Haudenosaunee traditional systems, and again, <laughs> I'm not an expert on this, but it was egalitarian since they had bodies that were specifically for women, for mothers to make decisions related to war and peace. Um, but they were also very familial. And so you had to be in a family relationship to get access to that representative, right? But also family was handled really differently. Like in Catawba Nation, if you were brought into Catawba Nation, adopted into Catawba Nation, you weren't just brought into the nation, you were brought into a specific family within the nation. And so I think a lot of the times we're trying to bring these kind of secular ideas of organization into trying to map them on tradi traditional indigenous structures that don't really make sense. For example, family, like we think of that as being in some ways like not a consideration of the political process in the United States, but for indigenous communities, family was the essential structural unit and it wasn't just biological right it was people who were adopted in people who were married and just a really good friend you know those sorts of things so yeah i don't know <laughs> uh, what about power rue how, how were decisions made decisions on war and peace decisions on the distribution of resources decisions on justice and law who made those decisions was there an element of democracy? Of, was there a, a, a space as the Athenians had, a place in the community where people could meet to discuss these important issues? Yeah, 
and again, this is a broad set of organizations, right? Um, in terms of like being able to come together to make these decisions, oftentimes I'll take Haudenosaunee uh, Confederacy again with the clan of mothers. So these are matriarchs within the various family units who come together to make a decision about war and peace. The logic as I understand it is that only people who have brought life into the world should decide whether or not people march to their death or like possibly lose their lives. Um, and, but this is what I think is most interesting about indigenous governance is that it provides us a lot of alternatives, a lot of imagination around what is possible and what a society could look like. So for example, like resource allocation, how do we allocate resources? In my community, um, we have this tradition of obligatory hospitality um, in the sense that explorers were kind of shocked that when they came through our territory, the rule was if you were hungry, you could just go into someone's house and take food. No one would think that you were invading. You were just allowed to do that. That's not a and very you, Lockean idea, is it, Rue? Right, exactly. You get shot and, and for this, doing that in America. <laughs> exactly. It, it's very different than the, I have a right to shoot you because you're on my property, right? And this was actually such a point of contention between Chief Hagler, um, who was a really important leader in Catawba history in the middle 1700s, where he goes before these colonial leaders and says several times, like, why won't your people feed my, my people when they walk by? Why do you drive them away with guns and uh, swords and things like this when they're just trying to feed themselves? Um, and you see also an example up in the Northwest of uh, what's called the potlatch, which is when people come back from treaty or from diplomacy and they're, or just bringing a lot of resources to the community, they are viewed as most rich, most wealthy when they can give the most things away. And so it's a very different understanding of what wealth is, what status is within a community. And I think that that's what's, what I'm most excited about is we can't go back. We can't go back, that's not possible. But, but what do we as indigenous people bring in our, you know, our backpack of tradition and culture into this conversation then can help us reimagine uh, from where we are on these tracks right now? Exactly. What do you bring? Uh, Ru, you, you, your website um, describes you as, and I'm quoting here, a queer artist, researcher, and organizer. Um, so you wear, so to speak, your sexuality on your sleeve. Um, was this a political issue in, 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 in indigenous times? Mm. Um, was there more openness historically about sexual identity and preference and even gender than there's been in American history? Was it as political as it is in America? So grow, like coming to college, under, learning about the LGBT movement, these activist movements, which are always traced back to 1969 and Stonewall, um, mm. what I found to be challenging is that that is not at all the experience of indigenous people, right? We, we create this narrative of progress that women have more rights now than they ever had. Mm. Queer people have more rights now than they ever had. African-Americans, indigenous. Right. Program. And th and that is not historically true. On Catawba lands, for example, women had immense power for a long, long time. The idea of women having less power and being in a position uh, to be abused or to be controlled is very recent, right? We've been here for 6,000 years. That idea has only been here since for like 400 years. And so um, some indigenous communities do have these long traditions of gender diversity. Many tribal communities have multiple words uh, for, for people who we would say fall outside the binary in English, but who are just part of kind of that cosmology of gender. My community is in a weird position because we have been encroached by settlers and Christianity for a long time. And almost all of our records about our language from the time were filtered through the lens of presumably straight white men. And so we don't, they weren't asking a lot of questions about gender. They weren't asking about the person who doesn't seem to fit in, you know, doesn't seem to fit these uh, binary roles. And so we don't have that language. And so one of the things that we're doing in my community right now around our language project is LGBT members of the community getting together and saying, okay, using our language, using our words, 
using our understanding of who we are as Catawba, how do we want to describe ourselves in our language? Um, because, you know, we've lost a lot. A lot's been taken from us. But, you know, we, we mourn that and we talk about that. But then we take the next step and say, but what are we going to do to provide for this next generation of Catawbas so they don't have to ask the same questions that we do? And how can you teach us? Uh, you, 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 you touch on religion, Rue. Uh, as, of course, no coincidence that, that the settler colonialism perpetrated by um, uh, eight, uh, 17th, 18th, 19th century Americans was done very much in alliance with the church using Christian ideology and uh, institutions. Um, is it any coincidence that many of the most politically reactionary um, parts of America when it comes to democracy are supported still by the church? Wow, that is such an interesting question. I mean, I've grown up in the South, like this is the midst of evangelical Christian country. Um, I went to a private Christian school for from the time I was in kindergarten or preschool until I graduated in high school. So I'm really inundated with the the talking points and the logic of evangelical Christianity. Um, and and I, I don't know how to parse apart this, on one hand, dedication to a text in which it is very clear to me the political aims of this figure named Jesus Christ mm. with the people who are described as Christians, followers of Christ, um, that is often more about exclusion. It's about consolidating power. Um, it's about a settled worldview. Um, and that's just been my experience of it. I think that also tied into the story of the United States has been manifest destiny, right? Like mm -hmm. when you ask people to draw the picture of the, the shape of the United States at the Revolutionary War, they draw it the way it is, you know, in 1940 with, from California to South Carolina when that was not at all what it looked like. But there's this idea that that was the thing it would always become, right? Mm. And and that that idea of manifest destiny was absolutely just entwined with uh, how Christians were talking about the United States and about westward expansion. Rue, how much can indigenous peoples teach us about this separation of church and state? What can your people teach us about a, a more responsible, valuable role for uh, belief in, in politics? This is such an interesting question because I think in this place, indigenous communities don't easily map on to any sort of binary left-right politics, church-state separation, because if you go to a tribal government meeting, there is prayer, there is ceremony, there is spirituality in in the in the proceedings of that meeting, and it's I, it's been true every tribal community that I've gone to across the United States and elsewhere, because spirituality is not seen as something that needs to be separate from the political life. Cordoned off, put in the back room. But what is also important is that indigenous communities generally didn't have dogmatic understandings of religion. It was usually a more revelatory understanding, which is one of the reasons why Catawbas up until the 1880s were super ambivalent about missionaries. Because a missionary would come along and they'd say, we have this story about this guy and blah, blah, blah. blah. And Catawbas would say, okay, sure. That there's no way that that conflicts with anything else that we're talking about, you know, because your job as a, someone becoming an adult was to have your own revelatory spiritual experience and to create your understanding of the world. And then the rest of this cosmology, the spiritual understanding was to help frame that and place you within society. And which is very different from how missionaries were interacting with tribal communities where, no, it was, you were supposed to create, you were supposed to have this belief and practice it and say it. Um, and these other things can't coexist. And so I think that's part of the reason why that conflict doesn't feel urgent in tribal communities between spirituality and political life. Rue, we have a, a Canadian partner for this third series on citizenship. And we spent quite a lot of time comparing and contrasting Canadian democracy with uh, American democracy, mm -hmm. uh, United States of American democracy. 
um, and America doesn't always come out that well. Um, one <laughs> of the areas where Canada seems to have, uh, so to speak, beaten America in is respecting indigenous traditions and recognizing both the criminality, the profound criminality of the original colonial enterprise, and then not only um, apologizing and doing as much as, as they can to recognize the crime, but learning from those indigenous peoples. Um, mm. I know you're based in the US, but you do quite a lot of international work too. I know you've been involved in some projects in Norway and elsewhere. Um, mm. Is America particularly shameful in terms of its treatment uh, of, 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 of indigenous peoples and its unwillingness to acknowledge it, th this, this criminal act and unwillingness to learn from other traditions? And do the Canadians do it better? <laughs> um, I can think of several indigenous people, First Nations people from Canada who would <laughs> very much disagree with the idea that Canada has interacted with indigenous people better. That's interesting, I mean, tell me more. I mean, we're, I, I'm interested in learning more on that. Well, first let's just talk from the statistics. The percentage of people in Canada who are citizens of First Nations is substantially higher than it is in the United States. And so that immediately creates a different dynamic. Uh, for example, the Southeast, which is one of the places, one of the regions in the United States that has the fewest number of tribal communities. What we experience is a ratio. So I, you know, for people who can't see me, I've got white skin, I've got blue eyes. I would never be racialized as an Indian, right? I'm, I'm considered white when people just see me walking around, but I am a citizen of the Taba Nation. But we also have citizens who are racialized as black. We have citizens who are racialized as Hispanic, for example. But even if they look like, you know, the old black and white photo of a Native American, they still don't get seen that way. They get tried, they are put into a different category, right? Whereas in places like in the Dakotas, where there is a larger proportion of Native Americans there, they deal with more explicit forms of racism, right? Like targeting based on, on your features. And I think from my understanding, that's a lot more of what goes on in Canada is that there is a lot more specific and racialized targeting as opposed to what we deal with down here, which is a lot more racial and, and just trying to convince politicians and lawyers and teachers that we exist. Um, you know, and just to give another example, you know, just in the last few weeks, we find 215 children who were buried in unmarked graves at a residential school in Kamloops, um, which was run by the Catholic Church just to bring back in this collaboration between the state and the church. Um, and so, so I think it's just really, these are really different experiences and in places where indigenous people are a tiny numerical minority they're gonna have a different experience than in a place where they are considered a racial minority that's large enough to be considered as part of the polity, uh, but still maybe subjugated in that context. As I said, I think you've done some work in Norway as, as well. Uh, is there a country or a region in the world which you think has uh, best faced up to the indigenous question? Oh uh, yeah. I know you do a lot of work in the United Nations too. You're you're part of something called UNDRIP, which sounds a bit messy, <laughs> well, I, but is supposed to be uh, a, a UN uh, initiative uh, on behalf of indigenous peoples. Well, uh, UNDRIP, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, was passed in 2007. Little factoid: the four countries that did not sign on to UNDRIP: United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia. Oh my God! The New yeah, so even the New Zealanders are in the hall of shame. They're usually the the best of the best. So <laughs> right, right, and and also coincidentally, all former British colonies, right? Yeah, well, um, the British certainly have <laughs> nothing to be proud of, and they, they were the ones who started this whole thing in the first place. But with under, I'm not you know particularly involved with anything at the United Nations, but it's been a part of my family story. My mother worked on it as a representative from the Southeast in the 90s. So I got to see kind of the UN as a kid growing up and working with Humanity in Action, these other organizations, trying to understand what indigenous rights mean within a human rights framework. UNDRIP is kind of, it well, it is the, the epitome of that. Um, in terms of countries that get it right, I think that 
maybe the country I point to is Greenland and its relationship with Denmark in yeah. that there's this ongoing negotiation about what status Greenland wants to have. Um, it's really interesting because I met someone from Greenland during my time at Humanity in Action uh, who did, did not identify Greenlanders as indigenous people. Um, they said, we're just Greenlanders, right? And that is something that we got to understand is that settler, indigenous, um, enslaved, like these are historical categories that come about because of our relationships to one another. And so in Greenland, they're in this position where they can not necessarily need that identity of indigenous um, to be able to pursue their political goals. So I think in that way, like I'm kind of amazed by what uh, folks in Greenland have been able to do, but. Perhaps I'm, that's I'm why uh, Donald Trump wanted to buy Greenland. Exactly. <laughs> finally, like, oh, uh, <laughs> finally, Rue, um, you've given us a wonderful tour and you're an experienced tour guide. I know one of your sort of polemical art projects is leading tours around the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C., uh, telling a different history of democracy and of America. Mm -hmm. uh, to end this particular tour, you've done a wonderful job. Uh, what do you tell people as a summary when you finish your tour, when you're retelling the traditional story of Jefferson and Madison and Washington and all these other white men who founded America and American democracy? What do you end with? What do people take away from your tour, your alternative tour of American history? I want people to understand that the stories they've been told might not be adequate to tell the history of this country and of other places. And I want people to understand, and I iterated several times during my tours, that I am just one person coming from a very specific context as a Catawba, and that indigenous people have many, many, many experiences and insights to share about the world that we're all living in. And so I always encourage people to seek out other indigenous um, speakers, storytellers, writers, researchers, um, who are doing work that inspires me and inspires the work that I do um, because, because I can't tell the full story. So we got to look elsewhere. Well, the Leslyn Rue, George Warren, I think you've done a tremendous job telling an alternative story on behalf of Katawa, uh, Kataba Indian Nation, as well as other indigenous peoples. I want to thank you so much for appearing on How to Fix Democracy. And I hope that the themes you've introduced will be uh, developed by other speakers in this series. Thank you so much. Hello, goody.